we had a female director. The schedule made sense. <laughs> there were no huge fights. If an actor had a personal thing, instead of going, oh, well, we'd all love to leave early. <laughs> We'd put our heads together and go, okay, how can we figure this out? I honestly look at all of you with such envy because, you know, you get an opportunity to try all the different roles, but we only get that opportunity maybe once. Like, how many times does a woman of color have to ask for something to go the way I need for it to go? And then you just, sorry to you. <laughs> Welcome to the Hollywood Reporter Actress Roundtable. I'm Rebecca Keegan, and thanks for being here. Can we start by talking about what you do when you really want to roll? What is the furthest you'll go when you really care about something? Ooh, write a letter. <laughs> <laughs> I have done that, yeah. yeah. It's never worked. No. <laughs> what do you say? Um, please. Yeah, pretty much, please. <laughs> Yeah, normally like very deep and emotional and like, yeah. When Winter's Bone turned me down, they were doing LA casting that I went to and then they were like, no thank you. And then they opened up casting in New York and I flew to New York and just kind of re-entered like, like a stranger. They turned you down? Yeah. And did they, they say, say that we've no, seen I you can't. before, you know? Yeah, I think that they knew that they had seen, yeah, maybe they were just scared at that point. And they were like, okay. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she wants it. Yeah. yeah. But isn't it good that they want the role? Wouldn't you want someone who's really passionate about it and will bring their full game on yeah. than just casting an actress who's like, oh, okay, I'll do it for, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's any harm in it. Maybe there's probably a line somewhere. somewhere. Don't go to anyone's house. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, is it? Is it, isn't it, as you say, Michelle, isn't it great to show interest or ambition about a part? Do you feel like there is a line that you can't cross when you're, when you're wanting to express interest? Yeah, the house thing. The house yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all ain't ever, you know, cast a spell on somebody? <laughs> <laughs> I think for me it was most difficult. Is sometimes when you get a script, a lot of the times I get the script and it's not written for a woman like mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. and if the director is kind enough to take a meeting with you that's the time when you are, you think should i voice you know maybe you should give me this role which i think is more suited for me i remember doing this uh, movie called sunshine with danny boyle and he's an amazing director it's a story about the astronauts going to the sun trying to save earth when i first re received the script it was written for a man to start off with so that was already such a joy that danny thought, well, you know, I would change it for you. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, I said to him, why do you think at that time, it's still the Russians and the Americans go into space? Wouldn't you have more Japanese, Chinese, mm -hmm. and it would be a more united group going up to save the Earth. It's not like a mission to Mars on your own, right? Mm -hmm. It would be a more collaborative effort. And I think it takes a very... um uh, director with great confidence of who they are and their vision, and he changed it. So, you know, we had Hiroki Sonata, we had Benedict Wong, yeah. and myself, you know, so we had like a real good diverse group of astronauts going to save the world instead of just all Caucasian. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. So I think that's the, the time when you think, can I make that bold step? Mm -hmm. Right, because the next thing they'll be like, okay, bye, thank you, but no thank you. I was going to say, I think it's also really nice to live in that passionate state, though. Like when you want something, when you're so full of desire that it burns you to the point where you have to like go outside of your comfort zone and make yourself so incredibly vulnerable in front of a stranger and say like, I want this with my whole heart. It's like such a generative place to live when you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm in a flame right now for this thing and I don't know if it's going to be expanded or extinguished but it's such a beautiful place to like to create from too and that even that if you don't get it it just sort of gets a little bit stronger and stronger and it like carries over to the next thing like I love 
I kind of love being in a desirous state, like before you like consummate something and you get it. Like I think that's actually like the most exciting time when you're like, gosh, this thing exists. And like whether I get to touch it or not, it's out there. And I'm and I'm I'm just grateful to know that it is it's in the universe and that it's like been created and that it's gonna go like out into like, even if I don't get to have anything to do with it, I'm just glad to like know it's alive. Mm -hmm. And I think you learn from each, like if you ever totally. had, I've had experiences where I've had like several meetings for things and ended up discussing in depth like the script and if it's a project you're so passionate about and even if you don't end up getting it, there's this moment where you think, God, but I spent so much time thinking about it and existing in that world of like what could potentially happen and it's sort of nice to remind yourself that there, is, there are things to be got from that in itself and that it's, uh, yeah, it could be a good thing. You learn things just from the discussions, I guess. Danielle, I know until you put yourself on tape with a scene where you were putting a tie on the child in the movie, Emmett Till, but you used your actual son to put the tie on for the tape. And I'm just yeah. curious, what was that experience like of recording that audition? Um, I mean, that's one of the more lighter scenes of the entire film. So I, I've done a, f a movie with my son before. And oh, so he just, you know, Aww. lends me his skills here and there. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was, yeah, that was easy. That was lighthearted. Um, the other two scenes that I did were more speeches mm -hmm. or like from the courtroom scene and from the Harlem rally speech. But I mean, I, he's, he's a darling. He supports me. And if I ask, he... He goes in with me. But I've always auditioned for everything that I've ever had to do. And it's the intuitive spirit of, if this comes, I would do, I would do this difficult, challenging audition and then throw it away and let it go. Was there any part of you with Till that was like, whew, if I get this, this I'm really I literally gonna... let that thing go. Yeah. Like I was working on from scratch and yeah. then, uh, I, it was difficult to even get to do the, the, the audition for it because I'm trying to negotiate these two things and reading this very, very tension-filled, anxiety-ridden script, I had to go about it slowly. And so, you know, when I did finally finish it after a week, and then they were like, hey, Danielle, you want to go ahead and you wanna, you can put this on? Okay, nudge, do it, and just relinquish it because mm -hmm. it, was, it was too much to, to continue to carry, you know? Yeah. I totally get that. Mm -hmm. Claire, I, I had heard that Sarah Polly originally envisioned you for a different role in Women Talking than the one you ended up playing. Is that right? I don't know whether she envisioned me for it. I think that it was one of those things where she was meeting probably everybody on the planet mm -hmm. and uh, was asking everybody. I, I think it was for a part that I would have tried very hard to act, but I would have really been acting it. Um, and then in the meeting that we had like on Zoom, she said, who do you like? Who's your you know, favourite character or who do you like have an affinity with? And it was Salome, it wasn't the original character. But I think she did that with a lot of women that she met. Mm -hmm. She was building a community and a group of women and also like a company of actors who was going to work well together and what that would be, what that dynamic would be like in that room, I think was the, the main thing for her. But I really felt like I was chancing my arm by saying who I wanted because I was like, everyone's going to want to play that part. Um, and then she, yeah. And what was it about that part that you felt that connection? I just really loved that she made the emotional weather in the room and with with a, like an acceptance and everyone had an acceptance of her as a as a person that she was allowed to be big she was allowed to be loud she was allowed to be angry and nobody took it personally and I feel like not just in my life but I see a lot all the time that if you are that way if you are quite a lot as a person um people tend to want to squash it or pack it, like make it not quite so much for them to deal with. Um, and the women in the room were capable of just letting her be who she was. And they were just like, yep, yeah, she needs a moment. Okay, let's move on. Um, there was no judgment with that. Yeah, I just loved being able to just be big. Mm -hmm. Once you have the role and you're starting to kind of sink your teeth into it, um, what's the first thing you do? Michelle, I remember you telling me that you have an iPad that you sometimes put everything you know about a character on the iPad, that that's something that you did for Mitzi Fableman. I've just done that with, with women that I've played who actually were. It just becomes like a localizing place because there's so much material. And when I started doing it, Marilyn was the first person that I played who was. And I was coming to set with this enormous heavy bag every day that had like all the books that had ever been made about Marilyn. It was like really big thing. And 
I was like this with it, and then somebody said, why don't we just compress this for you so you aren't carrying all of your books to work every day. Um, and trying to also be somebody who had so much, uh, had these like beautiful sloping shoulders and I would have my backpack <laughs> and stuff like this. Um, and so, and I thought, oh, that, oh, that's really helpful. I'm not, I don't, I'm not great with technology, so, um, uh, but I found that it's, it's just an easier place. And then you sort of have this like touchstone that you always go back to and then you can put in your little pods and you can like listen to a thing and it just sort of it also kind of just brings everything to the center too it's like a nice place to just go in between takes that you just have this kind of I don't know like homing device for this mm. person I haven't done it for women that I've played that that there isn't so much uh, you know archival footage that you need to gather all the photos and the sounds and all the things so mm -hmm. I've just used it for the I think three women that I've played I feel you in wanting to be more tactile though like it's something digitizing it takes away a certain kind of intimacy like the book is like oh this is how it feels and this is you know where the information is deriving from and you can connect the dots uh, you know it just it feels more um earthen yeah. and and connected yeah you yeah. find that with scripts yeah, yeah. yeah. I like yeah. having I want like my script in my hand. script yeah, yeah. rather yeah. than a, yeah I can't do an audition with and I yeah because I'd lose my place as well yeah. I'd be yeah. terrible and then it yeah, yeah. You know, you've got to have it in your hand yeah. Is it the same way in terms of wanting something tactile when it comes to your costume or your props? Like once you can touch something, does that help you? Sometimes, it depends on the character. For me, Joy was very, um, I really found Joy in the costume. Mm. Or, and, I, and I don't know if that had to do with like everything, you know, the sleeves had to be pushed up because she's a mom and she's busy. But it, that, that was, I think, the time I was most affected by by costume. Yeah, um, Mamie's much more of a, a woman of a certain era, and I am a bit of a thug. <laughs> and I'm, I'm with you, I'm over here, right? But you know, the, the costuming just, it just pulls you up erect. I mean, she's already going through a particular kind of taut uh, experience, a tightrope experience, but the dresses just make you elongate. And then not to mention the societal and cultural uh, uh, rigor of the time. There's a discipline to womanhood. Mm -hmm. There's a discipline to beauty. So yeah, it, it definitely yanked me up <laughs> in a certain way. Michelle and everything, everywhere, all at once, you're a million different characters. Mm -hmm. Are you just showing up on the day and looking at what's hanging for you in your dressing room and putting it on? How I, do you? I Did think you have a favorite? A favorite? The Rock. My best acting. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did your eyes and nose. <laughs> yeah. And I said, I'm not doing voiceover. It's not. It's got a no voice. You see, you know. um, but that one really needed a lot of prep because you were going from one to another, coming back and going to the next one. So apart from the continuity, which, of course, the script director and they would help, it's like in your mindset, what, why, and how are you going, how to be grounded the whole time. And it was, it was very difficult. I do a lot of action films, right? So, but in the action movies, I'm generally the one who's always in control, the mentor, the teacher. And in this one, obviously, Evelyn has no clue what she's doing. I mean, she's a failure in everything, which makes her so vulnerable and wonderful to play because she doesn't give up. Even though she fails, she will try something else so that, you know, she's on track to look after her family and, you know, to not be a failure in her father's eyes. So I go to this universe where I'm a Kung Fu master and then I come back to this. And so I'm doing all the moves, fighting with Jamie Lee Curtis, right? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of fun. <laughs> and then the Daniels, they come up to me and say, no, Michelle, you, you, you can't look like you know what you're doing. I'm like, what does that mean? And then you're like, yes, of course. Evelyn Wong doesn't know what, so she's got all these skills where your eyes have to go like, what the hell am I doing? But I'm doing all these, you know, amazing things. So it was very, you had to be fractured mm -hmm. to think like this, work like that. And it, it was completely out of my comfort zone. I was doing a lot of things that I normally have not done, but I was also thinking maybe I've spent the last almost 40 years of my career rehearsing for this role. Because, you know, I was suddenly doing comedy, physical comedy, action, horror, every single genre all packed into one and jumping in and out of it. 
the great thing was everybody was giving more than their 100%. But when I look at Jamie Lee Curtis and we just go, mm hmm, and we do our hot dog dance, yeah. <laughs> there is no, like, oh, I can't do something like this. I'm, you know, that's below me or whatever it is. We're like, yes, let's go for it. And we're like, oh, <laughs> spewing tomato sauce and ketchup. Um, but it was, it was such a, gratifying experience, I must say. I mean, I've waited a long time mm -hmm. to receive a script like that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as you get older, the letter that you were throwing around just now, <laughs> you know, as you get older, Sorry. you find that all the things go, you know, the, the box gets smaller and smaller. And especially for us, it's, n it's never been an easy ride to start off with. I honestly look at all of you with such envy because, you know, you get an opportunity to try all the different roles, mm. but we only get that opportunity maybe once in a long, long time. Crazy Rich Asians gave the Asian community such a boost because the last one was Joy Luck Club, which was like 26, seven years ago. And so it's very hard for us to say, like, who's your hero? That I don't know who's my hero because I don't really see it up there. Because, mm -hmm. you know, thank God we had Joan Chen and Lucy Liu. You know, they really fought for us to have a place. And then as the box gets smaller, then you're relegated to, I've been fortunate I played in Crazy Rich Asians. Because when, when I did press for that, what hit me the most was every time a reporter comes in, they go like, oh, my mom, my parents are really excited. I'm doing this interview with you. And you go, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, right? Because this generation of uh, film goers don't really know me. Because mm -hmm. Crouching Tiger was 22 years ago, even the Bond movie or whatever it is. So with Crazy Rich Asians, suddenly I am the mean mom. You know, the mom that's very scary, that says you'll never be enough. So then you go, okay. And then because of the success of Crazy Rich Asians, Shang-Chi was made with Marvel. So we had our first Asian superhero, mm -hmm. which was a big another great boost for our community in that way. So then I was the auntie, but then you can see the roles are getting from mother to auntie. And then when I received the script and say, please play the grandmother, you're like, no, yeah. walking away. <laughs> I'm, <sad. laughs> I'm not the, yes, I really, I was like, please don't put me in that box already. <laughs> you're like, no, 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 no. Resist. Can you relate to that idea of the box though? I mean, we all get put in them in different ways. Does anybody feel like, oof, let me out of this one that you've got me in right now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's inevitable. I think it, it's more convenient. No, fight it, fight it. No, 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 exactly. Don't allow no, no, it. No, absolutely no. I think I felt, weirdly, I felt that when I first started acting and I was doing lots of like TV, like British TV stuff, it's just inevitable what ends up happening is that everybody sort of goes, oh, you've done that, so we'll give you this. And you're like, but it's like almost identical. <laughs> um, I really don't want to do that. But then I suppose it's that feeling that you have that, what do you do? Like sometimes it is, I think very often it's things that you don't do that navigate your career if you even can navigate it I think basically is what you go no I'm not going to do that because I don't that's not going to stretch me or that's not going to mm -hmm. give me something that I need or and and then that might lead you to something else but if you go that way you know where it's going to go you're just going to keep doing that for, right. for the rest of your career I think basically but I do think that it is also our job to try and show people that's not the case like sometimes it is worth making the decision that seems a bit strange and it's an odd job and you're doing something weird in it but that to go that's not all I can do right. but it's just you have to be given the opportunity to do that and right. not that yeah. doesn't happen and it hasn't happened for so many people for so long. Mm -hmm. Jen I read you said that you felt like your choices had kind of been hijacked by other people and that you had to really take the reins back for yourself. Yeah I was um I was at a really big agency and I, I just feel like I had kind of given away my agency but that was also like it was also my fault you know I, I would watch things and be such a fan and you know I'd, I would watch Uncut Gems and be like oh my god the Safties that'd be so cool to work with them but like I didn't reach out and I didn't and that's something I've gotten better about in the last few years it's like when I watch something when I'm a fan let that person know because um, yeah it just I, I just realized so many things weren't you know kind of getting to me or people that I wanted to work with you know didn't know that I, that I wanted to and it just kind of hmm. um, I also think a lot of it was just kind of losing touch with 
the world a little bit. I think I got so, um, I was working so much and so much of what we do is has to do with observing people. Um, and I, I, I felt like I couldn't really observe anyone because everybody was observing me. Mm -hmm. And so taking a few years and kind of getting back to, to life, I feel like I can, I can kind of be creative again in that sense. Yeah. Does, has anybody else had that experience of kind of trying to make your own choices and there's a lot of people with a lot of opinions about what you should do and sort of figuring out for yourself? Yeah, definitely. Especially when, I guess, success or whatever you want to call it happens very quickly and you haven't been part of that world before and also when you're, what happens when you're young and you haven't quite found the power in your own voice yet in terms of what you want to do mm -hmm. but also in terms of knowing what's best for you and actually being able to advocate for what you need or yeah what you feel you want and um, I think that's been something I've had to learn really fast because also I'm a very much a people pleaser <laughs> generally in life and I think that's a wonderful thing in many respects I think it's also can be very very harmful in this industry because it means you get taken advantage of very quickly it's really important not only in navigating career choices, but also on set in terms of, you know, the hours you're asked to work, the things you're meant, you're asked to do, especially um, as, um, well, women or non-binary people. Um, yeah, it can be really important to sort of be able to know that you can say no mm -hmm. and draw a line and that that's not disrespectful and that's not, um, you, you, you can do that, yeah. yeah. I think I always felt that I had such imposter syndrome or felt like I was so green or so inexperienced that I, I had to take everything everyone else was saying as gospel. And I think that, yeah, it's been a huge breakthrough so very recently to learn to advocate for myself. Has anybody had an experience of saying no and realizing, oh, I got away with that? Yes. Please share. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yes. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, um, see, uh, when you real, when your body and your mind are pushed to a certain degree and you understand your limit, you will resist, right? I was on a film, things were being asked of me and I was expressing the need to not. And I was like, how many times does a woman of color have to ask for something to go the way I need for it to go? And then you just, you could, sorry table. Um, <laughs> you, you, you go hard and that when you're pushed to a certain degree, I mean, I'm a Taurus, like don't push me against the wall because then you have to charge out. Why do women have to do that? Why do non-binary people have to do that? Mm -hmm. You know, it shouldn't be about being pushed to a certain degree in order to articulate your need. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, when I realized that, I was like, oh, yeah, you, you don't want to have to go cross the line. Mm -hmm. Don't do that anymore. Articulate, articulate. Okay, you not listen to me on the second, third time. That's it. That's mm -hmm. it, you know. Is it Oprah, I'm, it, I'm hoping it's Oprah, who said, hear the no, like some people just can't hear the no. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to yeah. say to someone, yeah. just why aren't you hearing me say no, it's okay. Like, yeah. And I think a lot of the time what you're dealing with is people obviously projecting onto you. I can't tell you how many times I've said something so calmly, yes. like to the point of I'm almost yes. asleep. No, I don't want to do that. Yes. And um, I get, all right, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> like, I, I, I couldn't yes. be less aggressive. I actually, and then, yes. I, then I'm like there, and then I am like slightly aggressive. But I feel like I, my, it's really difficult. I noticed when I first started acting, I was like, oh, this takes up a lot of time and a lot of my life, and I'm expected to give a lot of my life over. And even then I was like, I don't think that's actually okay. And now what I've noticed is, I've just started to not think I have to do anyone a favor. Mm. Like I don't, I'm being employed to do a job. You're paying me, I'm here. I'm here, I'm committed. I wanna do this, this is great. Because an in industry is creative, I think sometimes, I think there is an idea that it doesn't have to be professional. Mm. And I really am a firm believer, it should always be, it's professional, like it's okay, there are boundaries and they should be respected. And that's what, I think it's okay to say, we are going to work until 8 p.m. and then we stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I. I Yes, I know the day's running long, but I've, we, I have to go home and I have a child, I have another life. Like, yeah. today I am not going to yeah. go over. And it not to be seen that you are Letting bringing people the down. Film, or bringing the yeah. film down, like you want it, or, the, or, the, or whatever you're doing. Like you you want to do it, you want to be there, but they, 
I think this industry sometimes really does need limits. Mm. It doesn't have any, so I don't know what I'm talking about. But like, <laughs> I do, I do feel like I just. Yes, I think okay voicing it's no. important. I think it, we, oh, like yeah. people should talk about it yeah, because otherwise, no. yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, it, still charges, it charges whatever the system or dynamic that we're working in because mm. each production is a system and starts mm -hmm. to articulate its own kind of you know qualities exactly. along the way. You say, mm. I'm, I got to go home. My child needs me. I'm doing this. Period. Mm. And then they will adjust. Well, the others will act crazy, <laughs> yeah. but we have to force them to adjust. They'll call you a crazy yeah. bitch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that's the other thing. There's a fear. There's a fear of saying like, I won't. I can't work past this hour. I, I physically can't do it, and that's yeah. like going to damage my working ability for the next, like tomorrow or the next day. Yeah. And I think there's a real fear of being thought of as a crazy bitch or a diva or like you hear these horror stories of people being like, oh yeah, I work with so and so, and you know, and you're like, oh god, I don't want to be like that. Mm. And it's such a sort of self fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? It's, yeah. Yeah, isn't it so interesting? Everybody seems to just need to be able to agree to say, we're quitting at eight, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Then nobody's the crazy bitch. And yeah, it, yeah and it doesn't have to be <laughs> yeah. a fight. It's no. okay, like, it's all right. Like, calm down, everyone. Yeah. I'm just gonna go home. When you're sort of figuring out your relationship with a director, how much is it that stuff versus the creative stuff? Well, it's hard because you don't wanna, it's, it's it, when, when you're on a hard shoot, like, what, Claire and Danielle are talking about, you know, where the hours are really long, the crew's exhausted, you're exhausted, and, you know, it's a, a technically difficult job. It's stressful to um, interfere with your relationship with the director because your relationship with the director is, should be purely creative, and it's scary to think about the two of you not getting along or mm -hmm. saying something. What if he gets mad at me if I say mm -hmm. I want to, if I need to leave at eight? And then he's mad at me, and then tomorrow, I, you know, it's he, gonna be strange. Yeah, and it's gonna be weird it, and awkward. Gonna be... He's gonna say things, something that's gonna make me uncomfortable. You know, it's it's a, it's it can be a fragile mm -hmm. relationship. Yeah, I mean, I thinking Michelle about when you're on a movie like The Fablements, you're literally playing Spielberg's mom. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, does that mean you get to tell him when to rap? I don't know. <laughs> now, what I think, what I'm thinking about is how often how often actors are made to feel like children mm. and that we don't get information. Mm. It's mm. sort of kept somewhere, it's kept away from us because I feel like they think we aren't, they can't trust us with the information because we might do something with it <laughs> that's contrary to what they want us to do with it. And that you always have this feeling of like something is happening somewhere and I can hear whispers of it, yeah, and but I it's not getting to me and I don't have the information and it's so frustrating. Um, but I, I don't know, it's happening less and less, mm -hmm. I think in my experience right now in like the last few years, I really do feel, feel a shift. Like I feel a difference after me too, I really do. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's, if you guys feel that or not, but I just, I feel like there's more information flowing because mm -hmm. there's more information flowing between all of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we're a little scary and powerful and I feel the, I, f I, I see more information coming to me and saying like now, based on the information, what decision do you want to make mm. with it? That we're just being trusted more. I don't know, is that just me? No, no, no it's not. I've, I've definitely felt a shift as well. Sarah Polly, the director I did with Women Talking With, she had the most amazing thing. I mean, she's just the most inspiring, amazing woman ever. And obviously she was an actor, is an actor as well. But she said that with, with this film, what she did was she prioritized the experience as opposed to the outcome of what the movie was gonna be. Mm. And I think that so rarely that's what happens and so rarely that's what's protected, that the experience of making, we've mm. got to enjoy make. I think yeah. the end game is so often the case, especially with things, oh, if everything involves money, but it's so often, where you're trying to get to, make something good, as opposed to just trying to believe that what you're doing in that precise moment is good, it is good, and it feels good, and the crew are happy, and everyone's fed, and everyone's had eight hours sleep, right. and mm. you know, and she did extraordinary things on that film. Yeah, for did the, they? Yeah, yeah, well, she, she, she's got three kids, so she was, uh. the hours were, this is what we're gonna try and do, if we can't do it, we're gonna talk to you about it, you know, and my daughter was sick at the end of the movie, and I was like, 
by that point so homesick that she was like, just go, just go, just go and shoot you out and you're gone, you're gone. Got the flight, maybe, like, I was like pushed onto the aeroplane. I was like, That's that would amazing. never, never happen. ever happen. It's doable. It's doable. Yeah. 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 Like, she really made the template have you read her, and it. Have you read her book? Yeah, it's, med- it's amazing. She published this book called Run Towards a Danger and it's so beautiful and it's like essays from a body of memory and it's about like, yeah, experiences she's had in her life with, um, I mean, so many things, but one of them is like her experiences acting as a child and the situation she was put in definitely before there's any kind of shift in the industry. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah, you just feel like she's learned so much through doing, and I, I think that there's working with directors who've been actors themselves. I recently yeah, worked with Law, who did Chatterley, mm-hmm. see, acted before, and you just feel like there's an understanding. And also if it, it creates this ability for you to be able to articulate something because you know that they'll understand, mm-hmm. because yeah. they'll have been there, it's relatable. Which makes such a huge difference. How did that show up on Lady Terror of the Slubber? There was a real feeling like, well, I think because we were quite close in age, it was just like a nice, I just felt like I could talk to her about anything. Mm-hmm. And also given the nature of what we were doing, like so many sex scenes and so much nudity, um, it, yeah, Law being a woman was incredibly comforting. And there was a, it was just felt very safe. And I really felt like I could talk to her about anything and really express my limits of like comfort or not comfort mm-hmm. yeah I mean there's so much freedom in that damn movie <laughs> so much <laughs> that I would I mean you have to trust your director right? yeah I didn't That's think I could have done it the if most I important thing hadn't. so I see that in every quality of how you're moving through the film Thanks. and the relationship that y'all had on yeah, I like that <laughs> <laughs> I think with our movie the the Daniels had to be so prepared because we are an indie film right uh, so and there was so many things to be done and we did the film in 37 days over six weeks no, yes. no you did oh, not oh yes we did yes we worked oh. every day but we were very conscious of the fact that you know when you're so tired there's no point pushing and forcing yeah, you to yeah, do it because it's done. just not going to come no, even yeah. if you do more and extend the hours Yes, yeah. and people get hurt, people, and you can see it's not there, and it will never, you know, come again. So what we do is, like, we have very fixed times, and I think that's very important. Then you understand, I have this time. I have to use it to the best of my ability. But at the same time, they always took the first um, 15 minutes of the morning to bring everybody onto the set. Like, you know, the departments that you will never see because they're hiding at the back and making the props or you know getting the costumes ready and we have like what we call the warm-up session the bonding session so we do like crazy exercises and oh, yeah really? yeah so 15 great. minutes we will take turns into appreciating everyone and then once we start off the the starting block that was it we were all you know motivated we go 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 and right at 12 hours we'll stop Mm-hmm. We have a 12-hour turnaround, which yeah, makes nice. such so a big difference. Good. But uh, this is also something that I've put, I mean, I've gotten to this stage in my career where I said, I can't do it because mm-hmm. I know myself by now. If you force me to give you that 16, 17 hours, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you can see me fade. You can just see her go like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So that, I think that if you set ground rules, Mm -hmm. you know, but you have to work to be able to set those ground rules. I think that experience for me was very uh, fruitful because you felt that your time was not just wasted. It was there and you were all in good energy and good form. And there was no one that was ever going like, oh, I can't come to work tomorrow. You know, you're Mm -hmm. so refreshed and you want to be there. Mm -hmm. So that that was a really, really good experience. Is it silly that when we get to talking about acting in terms of awards that we divide it by gender? Should it just be best actor, period, and we don't, we don't have a table for each? No, then there's more for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's silly, isn't it? Because is there a best, I mean, it's- I mean, I probably shouldn't say this, but is there a best act? Like, it's like yeah, the, it's the whole the concept whole is slightly really skew like already, that. so I don't yeah. really know how you figure yeah, that out. <laughs> Yeah. Right. yeah, I can't remember who said it, I'm, but my my husband told me, it's, it's an actress who said it, maybe you guys know, she said something like, we all love to run, but they make us wear colors. Mm. And I just thought that was mm. so beautiful, like maybe there's just no best, there's just like mm. people making stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree. I think that 
in the way that the world is heading and the shifts that we're making towards representation across the board, I think that there needs to be a change so that people who are non-binary or however you present or identify yourself feel included and represented. I think it's about feeling acknowledged and feeling seen and um, yeah, and I, but I think there is a lot of things to be worked out before then. For instance, I just think that there, it also comes down to there being roles for mm -hmm. queer people. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are more and more, but I think that there aren't enough yet that the categories like are changing. I think that it's one of those things that's, you know, the work has to come from the bottom mm -hmm. up. Um, so it's kind of rep a question of representation ac across the board. But I, I get asked this a lot in terms of, um, being non-binary but playing female characters and then where I feel comfortable in being considered for awards and stuff like that. And I, I, don't, I don't really know. <laughs> it's, it's very, I don't know, like it, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I play female characters. So there's also like, a, is the award for, you know, how much does the award have to do with you and your gender or the, the gender of the person who you play? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, Connie's female, so. Yeah, I don't, it's, it's, it's so difficult, I think. Yeah. But I think in general, it's all of these conversations are about including and acknowledging those people and feeling like anyone can identify however they want and still be acknowledged. There's been some conversation about how abortion is portrayed on screen. Um, in TV and movies, it tends to look very different from how it looks in real life. Does anyone have any thoughts on if there's a responsibility for TV and movies to adjust, to portray it potentially more accurately, especially given the changes, uh, at least in the US this year? I think never, rarely, sometimes, always did it the best that I've seen yeah. on screen. Eliza Hittman mm -hmm. um, did this film about a girl who um, needs an abortion, but she can't get one in her state, so she does a road trip with her best friend to get one in New York, I think. And it's absolutely incredible. But just in terms of like the way it breaks, it really captures the mundanity and the sort of bureaucracy in terms of how you get it. None of it's romanticized or glorified or like altered to, you know, work on screen. It's just very truthful. And um, yeah, there's an amazing scene where the main character is sitting opposite a nurse and going through a form and that's where the title com comes from. She asks her like a series of questions, like on a scale of like never ready, sometimes always, how much do you, how often do you have sex? Like, do you use protection? Who are you sleeping with? And it's like, you really, it's like all the intrusive, almost triggering sort of questions and that side of the experience, which I don't think is ever really captured on screen. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, as you say, all those little details were, yeah. were well, well shown in that. Yeah, I think it's critical. I mean, we're in, <laughs> we're in that moment now. Um, where each state has a different dynamic going on. I have close relationships where it ha it, the bureaucracy is out of control. F have to travel to this state, this state can't do it, gotta go to this state, this state can't do it, gotta go here, the medical records are da da da. Like all of those stories have to be evinced so that people understand how stupid it is to try to hinder women's choice. I mean the state to of Georgia has I'm counties Atlanta, without yeah. OBGYNs. Mm -hmm. People have to drive across state hundreds yeah. of miles hundreds just of to miles. get a pap smear, just to get medical care. Yeah. Because the attack is, it's on our, it's on femininity. Yeah. It's, it's absurd. DNCs are just as much a medical procedure. I had one when I had a miscarriage. If I didn't get a DNC, I could have gotten an infection. I could have died. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I, I think Back to the way it's portrayed in, in films, I think any time an abortion is portrayed as killing babies is not helpful mm -hmm. with that imagery. Mm -hmm. um, as Emma was saying, the, the bigger picture of what someone's going through when they're in a medical situation mm -hmm. brought on by sex. And I, um, I think that's an important, a more important part of the story, more helpful for, for women everywhere who need um, who need voters to understand that um, abortion is healthcare. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah.
It's really interesting. I'm going to steal from Sarah Polly again because she's a genius, basically. But she, our film is about... I'm obsessed with her. I, I'm obsessed <laughs> with her. She's like my favourite person. Um, but, she, but she, obviously our film is about sexual abuse and rape of, mm-hmm. you know, children and grown women. Mm-hmm. And um, what I think that she articulates really beautifully is that a lot of these experiences, um, whether it's childbirth, rape, abortion, are fetishized by movie makers Mm -hmm. and they become something which is less important than the actual human being that it's happening to and the impact of what that trauma does to them Mm. and I think that if we just dealt with that a little bit more then we would see the humanity of the situation which I think possibly might help a lot of people to understand it's human beings who are going through these things and that's what's happening to them in real life and hundreds of thousands of people every day are doing these things instead of making it. You have to look at who's making the movie, why they're making it and why they're choosing to put that scene in it and why are they choosing that frame of reference to portray it? What are they trying to do? Are they fetishizing it and using it because it's gratuitous or that it's, what does it say about that person, that woman, whoever it is? Like, what does it say? Like, I just think we have to ask ourselves so many questions. We've got such responsibility. Yes. For making sure that it's not just because it looks good on film. Well, it's so interesting as you're talking, Claire, I'm realizing there's trauma in the three movies of Jen, Danielle, and Claire. Each of your movies has a character who's recovering from trauma but doesn't actually show it. So the rapes aren't shown, the beating isn't shown, the war injury isn't shown. It's such an interesting choice and it's pretty counterintuitive, I think, for filmmaking. Was that something that you and your filmmakers talked about at all? I mean, it's obviously a, We definitely a huge, did. Yeah. Tanoya what, walked what to, I mean, in the conversation that she, which she had with the producers three years before, you know, coming to now, um, it was intentional to not show any violence. Um, it, we all know that violence. We've seen that violence. There are plenty of black and white images to that galvanized us, uh, uh, the civil rights movement in that way. But and, and also, it was about the point of view of Mamie, mm-hmm. and so Mamie wouldn't know that, mm-hmm. right? Or she wouldn't she wouldn't have witnessed that. Yeah. Um, and it was also to not re-traumatize the filmmakers, to not re-traumatize the audience. Um, this was about the arc of someone who comes into an understanding of their power in a certain way. And so, yeah, she intentionally didn't want to do that. three female directors, too. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Was that, yeah. how conscious was that in the case of your film, Jen? Because I know you shot some, some war sequences. Um, we did. We shot it, and I think less so for um, the idea of seeing violence and, and traumatizing people. It was more of... I think we once we got into the edit room, it was clear it was more powerful to tell a story about PTSD in the present um, by somebody who's haunted by the past and somebody who's making leaps and you know and, and um, healing not being linear. And it almost feels like when you're when you're reading a book and you can picture something, you know you know that this thing happened and it's kind of it leaves room for the audience to connect more with this character instead of it being about this specific thing that happened here and it looked like this. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? This person is healing from trauma. They're trying to learn how to forgive. You know, how does that make you feel? It almost includes more people. Mm -hmm. The less specific it gets. Mm -hmm. That is interesting that there are at least three female directors um, that made that choice. Is it easier to get a film with a female director made now than it used to be? Anybody had that? Jen, you made made such a face, I have to ask. (laughs) Uh, Easier than it used to be, yes. Yeah, still hard. I mean, you produced Causeway, so I assume you had some... We did, and we just, we, it was making me laugh when we were talking about the hours and stuff, because it was just so interesting to be on a female-led movie. My producing partner and I were the lead producers on it. We had a female director. The schedule made sense. <laughs> there were no huge fights. If an actor, if an actor had a personal thing that and wanted to leave early instead of going, oh, well, we'd all love to leave early. <laughs> we'd put our heads together and go, okay, how can we? Yeah, like how, how can we figure this out? We disagreed, um, and there was, and we listened to each other's point of views. Sometimes I was wrong and would learn that I was wrong and. Sometimes I was right. <laughs> um, and it was, it was incredible to not, 
be around mm -hmm. toxic masculinity to get a little break from it. And we would always, it, it did always just kind of make us laugh about how we are, you know, how we ended up with the, um, you know, women shouldn't be in roles like this because we're just so emotional. <laughs> and we're just, you know, so, and it's just, I have seen, I mean, I've worked with Brian Singer. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen emotional men. I've seen, I mean, the biggest hissy fits I've ever seen thrown on set. I've been, I've watched a man. I've, I've watched, she's, I think, my third female director and she's, they, they are the uh, calmest, uh, best decision makers I've ever worked with. I absolutely love working with, with female directors, but um, yes, it's getting easier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just think about y'all's film, right? Like, mm -hmm. in how you're talking about, oh, I get to be this person this, and have this kind of outburst. Like, there's just a different kind of respect and comfort in dealing with personalities and emotions. And I, I think of those scenes, all of the women talking and mm -hmm. having the, you know, having the outburst or being more, one being more demure and quiet. and there's space for everybody to exist mm -hmm. and no, exactly. e like Claire's sometimes movie. with a man like yeah. if an outburst is had there is recoil there is fear there's all of this emotion where you you can't be a full self but as a result of, of even you know your character having an outburst or anybody else having an outburst okay they had it and yet I'm still going to articulate my need mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought that was so powerful, like, mm -hmm. and, and being a part of a community where everybody, all of them are repressed, mm -hmm. and yet one, somebody's also saying, oh, they have all these different ways of saying what they need to, 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 to get, mm -hmm. you know? I just, it just, I feel like that sometimes is how female it sits mm -hmm. function. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets to be. Who they are. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Michelle, it must have been pretty extraordinary to have Steven Spielberg with the stature that he has being so vulnerable as it sounds like he was on the Fablemans. I mean, he's, he's kind of opening up his whole family history and he's described kind of losing it sometimes when he saw you in his mom's clothes. What was that like for you as an actor? I feel like I'm like stuck like 10 minutes ago trying to figure out if you can, how and if you can portray violence and rape without it being fetishized. Mm -hmm. I've thought so much about it because you're, you, you so often see it in scripts and you're like how, how it feels, and, I, and, and hearing that I have, I have a six week old so I haven't seen the movies, but I, hearing about how these films were created and that you, you don't see what happened, that it isn't, because you don't know where it's gonna go, like I, I don't, think that you can, you can't trust that it isn't going to be fetishized when you put it into like the wrong person's hands. And that if you can concentrate on the women and what their experience is and not concentrate on, it's just really, I'm like, I'm so moved to hear that this is happening. Like I've really, I'm like, wow, there's so much change. Mm -hmm. There's just so much change at this table. It's. Um, it's just like incredibly moving. I feel like I'm uh, absorbing some. I don't know what the question was, but I'm just like, <laughs> wow. I'm glad like, you, you were moved by it. I think it's pretty extraordinary too, just having watched films in the industry um, for as long as I have. And my question was about Steven Spielberg, who's someone we think of as this, you know, vaunted, venerable filmmaker, showing up, seeing you dressed as his mom in a house made to look like his kitchen and, and you know, kind of breaking down. Does that for you as an actress make you go, oh crap? Or does that make you go, ah, oh, awesome? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you just don't know. I mean, we didn't rehearse. There's, you're not, we didn't really, you sort of, everybody was sort of prepping in their separate sections and then you sort of come together and we, we, hadn't, we hadn't said words out loud and we hadn't, um, we didn't have screen tests. We didn't, you just, so you really show up on the day that you're meant to start filming with the person that you've been working on, you don't know. And um, so, yeah, to see him have an emotional reaction just meant you're, you're on the path and now you all get to, to walk it together. Mm -hmm. wow. mm -hmm. um, 
I have some light questions as we wind down. I know I hit you with abortion and trauma and a million things. <laughs> These are easy, I swear. Um, okay. Best way to decompress after shooting something really intense? Margaritas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Martini. Yeah, that locked and loaded. <laughs> Any others? I mean, I love my reality TV. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Emma, what's your go-to? All of them. Um, <laughs> love Island, which is British. <laughs> really guilty pleasure. I'm so sorry. God, all of them. Below Deck. Oh, yeah. Great. I just all the Below yeah. Decks. I had COVID, so I'm pretty caught up. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about that that allows you to just kind of like slip into the space? Just doesn't require any thought. It's yeah. Just completely, yeah. But do you? Okay. May I? <laughs> May I try to defend myself, please? <laughs> I had to defend myself to Woody Harrelson one time. He came into my trail and was like, "Are you really gonna watch all this garbage?" <laughs> and here's what I have to say about the garbage. You're watching interpersonal relationships yeah, that are as real, as far as I can see, they're exactly. real. I've never made a reality TV so show, so it's real, it's real, it's real. <laughs> I mean, I'm watching this fascinating dynamic between, yeah. like, there's the narcissist that clearly has borderline. My favorite diagnosis is I love diagnosing people with borderline <laughs> on reality TV. I'm studying and I'm a hero. <laughs> that's that's okay. all I have to say about I'm it. I'm not gonna lie, I watched Love is Blind. It's the best oh, show oh. ever It's that's crazy. Ever been made. I fast crazy. forward through the ceremonies just yeah, to get no, no, to no. the <laughs> I do's oh and now I'm, on the, now I'm on the reunion. It's a new one good, I haven't started it's it yet. So, so good. good. Okay. It just doesn't oh, not You're out. It's not like, what y'all talking about? Go home right now and watch it. There's three series to, I mean, honestly. We have a great one in the UK, Naked Attraction. Oh no, my God, I've heard about that one. You guys it's have the best sad. reality show that ever crazy. that I don't know why we did, is um, yeah. Don't Tell the Bride. Oh, yeah. It was a British reality. The whole wedding, and they get the dress chosen by the husband, and they always turn up in a helicopter, and like it's ridiculous. I've never seen them show up in a helicopter. Oh. The best one I saw. <laughs> so it's the br the groom plans the entire wedding, and the oh. bride can't know about it. And sometimes it's great and romantic, and like, oh, these colors are horrible, but thank you, honey. And then sometimes they break up over it. Like oh, yeah. one woman was like, not Vegas, not Vegas, not Vegas. Mm -hmm. Guess what? It was Vegas, <laughs> and he didn't invite her sister. Oh. <laughs> Borderline. <laughs> okay, last question. What's your desert island movie? The thing you could watch over and over and over again, and it's always Bridget happening. Jones. Bridget no Jones. No way, really? Yeah, that How just come? is what I end up watching over and over yeah, and over again. Amazing. When Harry Met Sally's mine. You've got mail. Mm. You've got mail. You've got mail. You are cute. Oh. <laughs> I watched Lord of the Rings one over and over again because I'm in love with Gollum. I'll say it everywhere oh. I go. Yeah. I'm not doing it. Don't <laughs> ask me. <laughs> 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 I, can I can do it. Oh. I'm really good at it, I but I'm going to keep this refined. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is it the voice? Yeah. yeah. Well, he's got big eyes. <laughs> Yes. And great hands. Something about this. <laughs> I did a, did literally was five seconds when he said you weren't going to do it. And she asked the question the whole time. She was like, Gollum, 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 Gollum. story, Gollum. 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 Don't say Gollum. Uh, Mitchell Williams, do you Sound have of music. Oh, oh, mine. That's mine, too. Oh. Really? The yes. 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 Yeah, you guys have a real connection. Um, well, I thank you all so much. This has been a great conversation. Really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thanks, guys.